I feel extremely privileged to be introduced to our speaker today. Um, one of the most enlightening statisticians of our time, Dr. Jun Liu. Um, he is currently a professor of statistics and a director of graduate studies at Harvard University. Um, I'm sure that he doesn't need any introduction, but please do give me two minutes to briefly describe his immense contribution to our community. So, um, Jun obtained his PhD degree in, uh, from the University of Chicago in 1991, supervised by Wing Wong. And Wing Wong had another student who graduated in 1989, that was Van Johnson. Um, so, uh, and then Jing became, an, uh, the Jing was an assistant professor at Harvard University. And he became, and after that, he became a full professor at Harvard University. Uh, apparently, he was never an associate professor. Uh, just, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Quite unique. Um, so he is a fellow of uh, Institute of Mathematical Statistics, American Statistical Association, International Society of Computational Biology. Uh, he has done a list of awards, including the most of the Hebrew Award, the Career Award from Alaska, uh, Michigan Award from Desta, uh Medallion Lecturer, Bernoulli Lecturer, Outstanding Achievement Award and the uh, Bao Lishu Award from ICSA, Morningside Gold Medal in Applied Mathematics, and many others. So Chin has um, revolutionized many, many fields, um, including well, data methodology, statistical computing, uh, statistical computing, uh, computational biology. Um, he's, uh, he has made groundbreaking uh, contributions to, for example, sequential manipulation, uh, deep sampling, sequence motif discovery, missing data analysis, image data analysis, and many others. So, um, and uh, and his book, uh, Manipulation Strategies in Scientific Computing, uh, in my opinion, is definitely the best, the best, um, I mean, the best out of the best uh, work, uh, textbook on sampling methods using data statistics. And in addition to his Huge research uh, achievements. He is also an exceptional mentor. So he has supervised more than 35 graduate or PhD students and more than 30 postdoctoral uh, research fellows. Let's uh, please join me in welcome. <laughs> Thank you, Sam, for a very uh, on, on a very humbling introduction. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, I've actually, as I was talking with students along the way here, I, it made me remember. I actually have visited the Texas A&M um, maybe twice or three times. I can't really remember, but I did remember the first time I came here, which was 1990, actually. Uh, I, well, I was still a PhD student. Uh, my one well, my best friend, Yun Chen, just became assistant professor here. So it was a happy time. The only thing I remember vividly is I got the speeding ticket. Or <laughs> driving towards uh, Houston or, or driving from Houston back. I forgot which way it was. But anyway, so it's, uh, it's always a fun memory when I think about Texas A&M. So it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, especially to see so many friends and colleagues here. Okay, so uh, so someone mentioned they've never attended the Basin Talks. This is actually uh, probably the only my only published non-Basin work. Uh, <laughs> or, or to be published, not quite published yet. Uh, I think of all my publications, uh, previous publications, they're mostly uh, computation oriented or basic oriented or application oriented. There wasn't any uh, non basic methodology oriented paper. As I can recall, maybe I was wrong. So, but anyway, this is purely uh, a, a different uh, sort of venture. Uh, it's, mo it's a stimulating, motivated by our junior faculty, Lucas Jensen, when he gave a job talk a few years ago to our department. Now he's, uh, he's our assistant professor. Uh, he's fabulous. And he talked about this knockoff ideas, and then that made us to uh, to think about this uh, uh, variable selection and with uh, with FDR control problems. So that's how it started. Uh, I will just give a brief outline. So 
Mostly, uh, the biggest breaking idea was motivated. Uh, it's never, it's not really a new idea at all. The data manipulation, data randomization, or resampling has been around the statistics communities for as long as probably one can remember. Uh, famous methods include the like bootstrap and also the uh, uh, the, uh, the various type of, uh, I think, even. Some basins did this data sort of uh, subsampling ideas and so on to, to form, formulate certain data based files. Uh, there are a lot of similar ideas for just manipulating data to see uh, the robustness of certain methods. Uh, but that's, that's one of our reaction yeah, when we first saw this uh, uh, knockoff ideas. It seems to me uh, knockoff is some way. As, as a perturbation, but they're not directly on the data, but trying to create some fake variables, uh, which we thought is probably too expensive. Maybe there's something cheaper, but uh, at a certain price, I think. Uh, so uh, I'll be talking about this data speaking ideas and several uh, extensions, uh, and also uh, some simplifications trying to understand theoretical properties. Uh, to be just uh, uh, just briefly introduce this, uh, maybe review this uh, BH procedure. I hope I probably read most everyone knows here. Uh, but essentially, if you have independent multiple tests, if you have p values, uh, you can run all this hypothesis uh, according to the p values and then have a threshold uh, tracking uh, so that. The, the hypothesis you rejected, uh, suppose that's called the discoveries, are mostly true and they are controlled at a certain proportion, so called uh, 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 the FDR, uh, false discovery rate, uh, which is using Q uh, to represent that, to differentiate from P value. Uh, so from the picture, it looks like this. So we run the P values and we draw a uh, red line, which is according to your Q. So uh, so it's really going from, from zero to, uh, to the value of Q and then, oops, which way it is. Uh, and then we see the, the intercept. So that's the, that's the way we can find the threshold. So one of the surprises is that uh, I, I later learned, I think many people who have studied this knows, this is almost optimal you can, you can do in some sense. Uh, even for, for Bayesian, it is pretty surprising to me because in the Bayesian way, uh, you can, you can uh, formally formulate everything, you can do the so-called uh, optimal uh, threshold according to the Bayes rule. Uh, they're sort of very close to each other. I was, uh, I was quite surprised. Anyway, there are some modifications to uh, cope with the dependent hypothesis. Uh, and they are too conservative in most of the case, so people don't really use this too much. And still, even in the correlated case, people still use p-values mostly. For example, in the regression, if, if, if the design matrix is not too correlated, uh, the BH procedure is pretty good just for regular regression if n is large enough. But if in you know, high dimension p and n of the same order, there's some problem we will mention a little bit later on. Uh, so the basic framework is this. So we have uh, uh, multiple uh, features, typical regressions. And we also talk about the in which case it could be formulated as a regression with just the uh, uh, with, with, with just the, uh, the, uh, uh, the indicator variables. Uh, but they're sort of uh, equivalent in that form, but the main problem is just a little simpler, I will mention a little bit. Uh, but more generally, we talk about this regression framework. We have p coaries that we're interested in uh, finding which coefficients are non zero. Uh, so this scientifically, this problem with the basins, uh, you, you listen to this uh, uh, standard basins, this, this is uh, a standard uh, silly problem because in science, uh, nothing is truly zero, nothing is truly non-zero. So in, in some way, you are always just dis differentiating whether someone is contributing more, someone is contributing less. Uh, from my own experience, if you, are, if you care about prediction, actually, uh, this level of selection can be very dangerous, uh, especially when the signal is weak. For the reason that 
if you do premature elimination of useful features, there's a lot more harm for them, including a few drugs. Uh, so that's uh, that's my uh, uh, so in other words, uh, doing something like this regression where we clear one sometimes give you better prediction results uh, than than the so type of things, uh, which give you shrinkage and also keep all the useful variables around. Uh, I can't explain why that's I mean, quite magical in some weak signal cases. Uh, but if the signal is strong, there's a, it's hard to say anyway. Anyway, but this, this setup is uh, interesting that uh, at least theoretically enable us to think about this more. But uh, by the way, also the basic methods actually uh, using this kind of uh, uh, mixture priors uh, does a better job than, uh, than, than, than even the range regression in the weak signal case. So, so it's still have the advantage of uh, model averaging. Uh, it's better than just threshold off the, the variables in the very weak signal case. Uh, but in most of all these studies, uh, people, uh, theoretical studies, we don't really, uh, we have some kind of rate of, of signal rate to specify whether it's weak signal or strong signals. Uh, but in practice, it's hard to realize what that means. So you sort of just need to keep decreasing the rate and, and see how where the method, uh, keep decreasing the signal strength to see where the method may fail and so on. There's always here saying the signal has to be loud or whatever, but times a constant C, but whatever that is C is, uh, you can make it arbitrary. Uh, anyway, so, uh, so, P, so then generally p value based methods, if you think about linear regression, you just use p value. They're typically not bad, as I mentioned, uh, if, if n is sufficiently large. So, uh, unless the variables are highly correlated. Uh, the high dimensional case is a little bit uh, tricky. There were some data splitting ideas already. Basically, when you use part of the data uh, and, and then Okay. Yeah. Then do the uh, do the selection. Uh, then you, you after your selection, you do some p-value calculations. Uh, reason for hot methods, the so-called knockoff methods. Uh, the intuition is to create fake variables as a control. It's a little bit like a what biologists and other scientists do in their experiments. They want to see the effects. They have so called spike ins, which are the fake things. Uh, they know the quantities and they, as a calibration. Uh, the new kind of ideas uh, in spirit similar to that. Uh, so, so, this is a knockoff ideas. So, so, suppose the, if you look at the figure, suppose the left part uh, is the, uh, is this, where's the, this is the point? Yeah. This part is the original features, and this part is the so-called knockoff features. And uh, there are some requirements for knockoffs. You need to be sort of extendable, parallelized extendable. In other words, uh, you're not supposed to be differentiate these two parts just by looking at them. Uh, but this one is usually in, in the real data model, supposed to write depending on only this part. This part is made up by the, by the user. And the extendability has two forms. One is the joint distribution has to be the same. Another one is if you replace just the corresponding variables, if you replace this part to this and here to here, uh, the, the distribution does not change. So that's somewhat a, a strong requirement uh, for these fake variables. They need to be distinguishable from the real ones in some sense. Uh, but that, that puts in a lot of constraints because uh, once they are too correlated with, with the left because of the correlation uh, joint distribution requirement, also because of this kind of extendability requirement, uh, they can decrease the power uh, significantly. Another thing is this can be quite expensive, uh, especially in high dimensions. Uh, in the original paper, you need uh, uh, either in the dimensional case, this can be just done by uh, Exactly, uh, by enforcing this type of uh, covariance uh, structures. But in high dimensions, 
the need uh, to have a distribution for the features, I uh, originally we need to have the joint distributions of the features to be normal or something like exponential families. Uh, later on, uh, my colleague extended this uh, to allow unknown parameters in exponential families and still have the exact control. Uh, the central idea is to conditional on the sufficient statistics to do con conditional randomization type of uh, procedures to create this uh, uh, knockoffs. So there are some continuing uh, progresses along the uh, direction of knockoffs, uh, trying to make this possible to uh, to create them, and also there's an, uh, some other similar works to uh, to select what kind of uh, uh, contrasting uh, uh, statistics you need to use to in order to make it more powerful. There's some work along that way as well. Uh, but in general, this type of requirement seems to be uh, more strict than some other requirements, uh, like even more strict than linear model assumptions, in some sense, because joint distribution of one million feet or one, yeah, or 10,000 features would be, would be impossible to think of. Uh, but, but, but the linear model with 10,000 predictors or 1 million predictors uh, seems to be reasonable, and it's especially if you assume some sparsity conditions. Uh, anyway, so, so there are a few works along this one. So uh, one of the fundamental ideas in uh, view is that uh, as you introduce focal self-referencing uh, framework, that is, we don't have to rely on p-value, which is more so-called uh, a value by itself, uh, uh, it's an uh, well, absolute measurement. Here, the self-reference is to uh, basically to use the uh, uh, the, the norm, like nouns as a control as uh, to to select the true non nouns So, in other words, the self-reference means that uh, in the default case, you have a Original variable will have knockoff variables. So these are like uh, symmetric. If, uh, if this variable is, uh, is useless, they are all useless. So there are sort of behavior of differences uh, or contrast will serve as a baseline for you to differentiate uh, those which are, say, suppose this is really useful, but you know this knockoff copy is not useful. So their contrast needs to be different. So that's sort of the self referencing uh, we. We think about. So, in other words, if we can create some kind of statistic MJ for a J's feature, uh, assuming that is symmetric uh, under the null, uh, symmetric along uh, zeros, then we can use this negative part uh, to uh, as a control of the positive part. So, you, you, so that's sort of the idea of uh, of both this. Markov and our idea. So data splitting is this. Uh, so data splitting is just simply you split data in halves. So then you do, uh, let's think about it just simple linear case uh, with low dimensions. So you just do two one linear squares and you have two set of uh, estimates. Okay. Then if you look at one features, you can have uh, beta one J and beta two J. Then we do a contrast. If they are significant, both of them should tend to have the same sign, and and they tend to be relatively large. And uh, and if you uh, and then under so under the null, if it's useless, so it's two independent data set. If it's really coefficient zero, then this distribution will be symmetric around zero. So in other words, the sign to be will be symmetric. And uh, we came up with general forms, which is a uh, sign of of the of the product of the two, with uh, with some kind of measure of coherence, this so-called F. Uh, so F have different possible choices. So we found that the multiplication, also the the, the I think uh, which one is good. So this is multiplication, and this sign max is actually one of the optimal choice. Uh, in words, it's really just sign of the product of the two estimates and also the maximum of the magnitude. Okay. 
the max, uh, maximum of the distance magnitude. So if they are the same sign, then it's just the maximum of some of their uh, some of their magnitude. If they're different signs, then it's definitely not as good as well. Uh, so, so this statistics is very easy to see that's the metric around zero under the null. Uh, so you can see that if you do this for uh, multiple variables, you will have some features like this. Some features uh, will have large positive values. Then you can see that uh, this this is statistics. Sorry, this statistics tend to be large. Uh, when it's now now and uh, it's uh, yeah but they tend to be uh small or uh, negative when it's now now so uh so this is simple argument by using the proportions that are negative we can estimate the the proportion of positive which is under the now so in, in, in other words uh you use this part as the estimate of this part Okay, and then uh, the red part is supposed to be the selection and they will cut off. Then you can see that this blue part relative to the red part will be a false positive rate, a okay, false discovery rate. And this blue part is estimated by, by here. So that's, uh, that was the, uh, uh, the idea. Uh, so similar ideas I also have I have seen this by from some computational biologists when they do microarray analysis. They are trying basically using the negative tail to estimate the positive tail. But it wasn't I was never made it very formal, but that's a sort of very idea wise is uh it's not nothing surprising. Okay, so the heuristics you can show this is uh, following this can, can do the FDR. So you can show some kind of uh, asymptotic FDR. It's never exact FDR, uh, which, which is, I mean, the price we, we have to pay. Uh, the, the benefits of this procedure is very simple. You just split data, do two estimates, and look at the, uh, the left tail and the right, right tails. And then, then you do this the threshold estimate, uh, threshold to decide the positives. And the price we pay is that we, we sacrifice the so-called exact uh, FDR controls as in the knockoff. Knockoff has those so-called sign dependence, and then we use this Martingale things to, to prove the exact FDR control. But this one doesn't have that anymore. Uh, there's another procedure which is related to data splitting is called the multiple data splitting, which is we do repeat the same procedure multiple times, then we assemble the results. So it seems to be also a very natural idea uh, because if you just do it once, uh, there's too much randomness and you may you may not uh, have the best results. But if you do multiple times, uh, you can you can uh, make them together. Uh, the way we, we assemble them together is uh, to introduce the so-called inclusion rate idea. So one variable's inclusion rate is uh, so so for each each replicate each test. So rather, for example, x one is selected, and suppose in this case we only selected the three variables, then the inclusion rate for x one will be one over three. So the total inclusion rate for everyone sum up is one. So if you're not included is zero, if you're included uh, as one over the number of inclusion, number of variables included. So the reason for dividing the total number of, of uh, variables selected is to accommodate that some messages of selection is very lenient. Some messages uh, is less lenient. So we will accommodate that. So if, if you have very strict method and still be selected, the inclusion rate is higher. Otherwise, uh, it's a lower. So then, for for each each replication, the total inclusion rate is one. So the average inclusion rate is uh, the total sum is one. Uh, so this will actually have nice interpretation. Uh, if if each of this method, data speaking method, have the FDR control, that is, uh, you include at most two percent of uh, of false discoveries. 
That means all this uh, true null variables, the total sum of inclusion rate will be no, no larger than Q. So in other words, if you take average, and for all those true null variables, the sum of the inclusion rates should no, be no larger than Q. So that gives us a threshold uh, to cut. So this was a demonstration for, uh, forget about the settings, and here I'm just, you just think about the 500 features, and with some variable selection uh, procedures, I replicate this uh, uh, 200 times, uh, inclusion, or maybe 500 times, I forgot exactly. Uh, the inclusion rate for some variables will are probably here. Uh, the blue ones are the true negatives, uh, and the red ones are true positives with uh, signal similarity by some normal uh, non zero uh, or normal uh, distribution. So you can see a large portion of them have an inclusion rate close to the maximum, uh, which is uh, 0 0.00 whatever, that's one over the number of tested. And, and uh, uh, some of them are in the middle, and you can see here there are also some higher and lower. So our procedure is to rank all the features according to the inclusion rate. We can see this is the uh, after the ordering them. Uh, for this part, the largely they're all red, are true positives, and there's some mix of red and blue here. There's also some mix of red and blue here. So our, our criterion is to select features uh, to, to, to basically uh, uh, choose a threshold so that cumulative with an inclusion rate uh, will be smaller than Q. So we find the largest uh, threshold so that, so which is A. So this is the, this one will be, this is relatively conservative. The logic is that if we are if all the features are truly ordered according to their uh, now or now, now then, uh, then everyone, so the, the total sum of inclusion rate of all the true nows will be Q. So in other words, here we are included, if we cut off this for Qs, and, and those included, which are selected on this side, should have proportion of smaller than Q. And we can even, Make it a threshold a little more lenient to allow uh, a, a few fractions. As we call this as a, a conservative threshold. This is somewhat a little a non conservative threshold, what I call the aggressive threshold. So, so this is L star, this is uh, L, is the cutoff. So that's the, that's the uh, MDS procedure. And, and lately, there's a new paper just published this year by. Uh, Lena Barber uh, from the University of Chicago and her student, uh, who proposed a similar, very similar procedure, uh, slightly different, but they can have the, but they, but they are not based on the data splitting, they're based on multiple Markov methods. And um, they also have a similar, uh, similar like inclusion rate, but they use the left pair instead of right threshold as a, as a way to, to, to get the E values. Uh, in their procedure, we can, we can show they have uh, exact uh, controls, but they are more conservative, a lot more conservative than, than this criterion. Uh, one of the open problem we had is for this procedure, we still cannot prove this actually can have the correct control. We can have some uh, almost, I, I always say it's almost like fake mathematics to show this as so called asymptotic control, which, are, which I think is. Uh, it's not uh, real, but in particular, it works very well. So, uh, anyway, so uh, we simulate the more data uh, to, to understand what's this inclusion rate like. And um, in this very simple level problem, we assume the data is a uh, MIP matrix, and each column of the axis has its own D. Uh, so, that's why we call it normal mean problem. Uh, our task is to figure out which of the mean is non zero, and uh, assuming a uh, small proportion of the means are non zero. In this case, uh, on the left, there's P is 800. We have eight, uh, 800 features, and N is 1000. Uh, the, the number of features actually quite large is 160 out of, 1, uh, out of 800. 
Uh, but still, it's, it's not that bad. So uh, we're con considering the effect of multiple uh, data splitting, and we're plotting against the p-values. So you can see that for this problem, we, may, we, we almost know everything about this. We know the, uh, uh, because they're all independent, we know the BH, how the BH works. We also know how to do the basing things. And after all, everything should be a, a function of the, of this uh, z, z statistic, right? P value is the multiple function of the, the absolute value of the z statistics. And so this other criterion, all the basins should be uh, criteria should be monotonally related to that. And so you look at the uh, data speaking things. So you can see the last figure. Uh, we, we plot everyone against the p values. So the uh, so for one data speaking, that's that's uh, 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 that's another. Yeah, this mirror statistics we call sometimes called mirror statistics, sometimes called uh, symmetric statistics. So this is one data speaking. You can see you get a very noisy distribution. This, there is some trend, very general trend, not only uh, related to the p values or not only related to the z stat. Uh, but, but on the other hand, they're not uh, very uh, convincing, they're pretty noisy. And if you do think of uh, splitting multiple times, you look at the inclusion rate. Uh, plus science is 400, and uh, the, the, the blue star, blue dots are uh, 10,000 uh, multiple data splitting. So we are more almost exact model from the related to p-values. So that means the information revealed by multiple data splitting is equivalent to p-values. And this part we actually can show, it's not, not exact, you can show in probability that are uh, almost monotonally uh, related uh, to each other. Uh, so that seems to suggest that the information uh, is not lost once you do multiple data splitting. One more the criterion is how you, how you decide uh, the, the cutoff. So, so we think we did some simulations trying to uh, understand this problem. We compared to the so-called Oracle variance, uh, which means that we, everything is simulated by basic models, and then we just calculate posterior probability of this feature being from positive or negative, and then we we cut off we we, we select features. We order, we order the features by this posterior probabilities and we select feature, the, the, the null features as the cumulative uh, probabilities no greater than Q. So that's exactly following the concept of false discovery rate in the Bayesian sense is the false positives. And that actually is the perfect answer in this case. Uh, but this is we call it oracle base. And, uh, and then we call it Oracle empirical bias, is we assume the model is correct, it's just coming from a mixture of two normals. Uh, but we have to estimate the parameter, that's what we call it, it's Oracle empirical bias. So once, uh, once we start to estimate parameters, the bias approach tends to be uh, uh, too aggressive. Uh, but I will show a little bit later. But this picture is just showing that all monotone relationship uh, related to the p-value, this minus log p-value. So uh, so the higher, the more likely. So we can see the procedure probability for these guys are close to one. The inclusion rate is like here. Uh, the, the lines, so this line is the cutoff based on the inclusion rate uh, for that. And this is the empirical bias, and this is the perfect bias. And this dash is based on the DH procedure for p-values. They're all close, but not exactly the same. Uh, so we did more simulations, just trying to see that. And here is for different uh, Q values and different uh, signal strengths and comparing the, uh, uh, the Oracle base and the empirical Oracle, the second one, the third one is BH. And the, the last two are the multiple data splitting and the one is conservative one, so we see this is conservative one, this is uh, more aggressive ones. The more aggressive one tend to be a little bit overshooting in terms of control faults uh, when the signal is weak. 
but the signal is strong as we quite well. So the, the aggressive ones have been controlling very well in all other situations. And if you look at the, uh, the number of correctly detected features, they also the, the aggressive uh, ones are doing quite well compared to Oracle bias. Uh, the empirical bias ones uh, is bad as two overshooting when the signal uh, is weak. So uh, I'm not exactly sure how to uh, make this work. Maybe we do more full basing and everything need to be sampled from the OCA distributions can, can, can alleviate these issues. Uh, but that may be uh, too costly for me to, to make these comparisons. And this is based on 200 replications for each set settings. So I also, also plot it and also see the similar pictures as, uh, especially in this part, uh, if you look at the, uh, uh, the, the signal strength, the signal is weak, this imperial base can be pretty wild uh, in terms of controlling or selection. And, and this is still compared with the imperial base, the number of correctly selected, this is BH, uh, this is the multiple data splitting. So it's, so this is still, uh, empirically observed, it cannot prove the multiple data splitting be the same thing as the BH or base. So that's, if someone interested in theory, that's one part we are, I, I personally am quite curious to know. Anyway, so uh, here is more uh, general uh, setup with uh, linear regression models uh, in high dimensional case. So in high dimensional case, the way we do data splitting can have two ways. We actually uh, it has about two ways. So one is uh, we can use lasso for, for half of the data, assuming the so called screen properties, you only keep those selected ones, suppose selected ones are below P, sorry, are below N, below sample size, uh, then we use second half only on those selected variables to do uh, least square. So once you do least square, once one part, as long as one part is the least square estimate, you can ensure this uh, new statistic is symmetric under the null. So once that is satisfied, we can use this data splitting procedures. And another strategy is to use that. So on both parts, but then you have the bias, you don't have a symmetry anymore, but then we have to apply this de-biased lasso procedure to do that. That actually works quite well. So, uh, so this one is slightly cheaper, just do lasso for one and then use the selected variable to do OIS for the other part. And uh, if you look at the FDR control, they are controlling quite well uh, for various uh, uh, designs of, uh, of covariates. Uh, like mixture Gaussian and key distributions. And uh, you can see the green ones, the Markov. Markov did a good job uh, when, the, uh, when the design is as assumed as, as a similar, multi Gaussian. Uh, so you can see the power is pretty good, but it's still uh, the multiple data splitting is uh, very, very competitive, especially. It's becoming better when the correlations among the design metrics are higher, uh, which which probably is not surprising uh, because uh, the high correlation of the design metrics enforces this uh, not of design to be more correlated, so it decreases power more. Uh, but once you go beyond the main distributions, uh, the the knockoff is losing all the controls in this case. So. And uh, here, one of the interesting uh, variation we had is this, uh, uh, in the generalized linear model. Uh, generalized linear model different from, from the linear model as recently discovered by uh, Emmanuel Candice and the, uh, his uh, students, Paul in this 2020 paper that in this model dimension case where n and p are proportional, but we can still assume n greater than p. Uh, in this case, the MLE uh, classical theory no longer hold. It's still asymptotic normal, but it's with shifted mean and the shifted or the scale of the covariance. 
So that make uh, the p-value based methods to be very uh, difficult to apply directly because uh, as in poly normality still holds, but with different mean, different variants as what we classically know. Uh, so that created the trouble for uh, for this. Uh, fortunately, well, uh, well, unfortunately for us, uh, fortunately for them, they, for, if you do logistic regression, uh, they actually found a way to adjust that explicitly. So there is adjustment. You can, you can actually estimate this shifting parameters, A star and sigma star. So this is very interesting work. That's also motivated us to think about this problem. The one thing we notice that under the null, where this beta J star is two zeros, we don't care about shifting anymore because this is still symmetric, because symmetric around zero. Uh, that's that's the way we are in, and we don't need this kind of scaling factors uh, because we are not calculating p values. We only need to know they're symmetric, and then we use uh, this kind of symmetry uh, uh, to control the false positive. So that's that's the uh, uh, motivation of our work uh, for generalized linear models, and also there are some other models. Uh, the similar phenomena still hold like lot linear models and so on, uh, but there's no more known uh, results for alpha star and the sigma star. So in each case, there's no known adjustment uh, for this case. So, so briefly, this is the outline of our uh, data splitting procedure. So one is to just split the data, then estimate the coefficients uh, that the parameters by NLE, and now we do a little bit of adjustment to rescale them so that they're all in the comparable scale. The way to rescale them is to uh, divide by the estimated this residual sum of squares. Uh, so after this thing, we have this uh, two statistics, and we use the same uh, same value we have, which is the sign of the product times the their 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 uh, sign max. In, in other words. Now we select feature for this. Uh, for multiple data splitting, we do this uh, multiple times. So this is for a uh, lower dimension case. Uh, so here, some of the medical illustration you can see uh, for P is small and the A is not very large. And you can see in this case, the standard uh, MLE uh, as a topic actually works reasonably well. So if you just use the plain e value based uh, pH procedure that works quite well. It controls the FDR. I think here is point, point 0.1, so they control very well, and the power is not bad. And this is the adjustment, and this is MDS, so adjustment is also working, so everyone seems to be working. The knockoff is slightly worse. Um, but if we increase the A and the P proportionally almost to 10 times, so it becomes 500 and 3,000. Then the asymptotics uh, become problematic. Uh, you can see if you still use the BHQ, the FDI is out of control at 20%, uh, because uh, the p value resulting from using the asymptotics is wrong, has the wrong scale. Uh, but with the adjustment is still being wrong. So once you have this adjustment based on the formula developed by Candace and the CERC, uh, they can do a good job for the logistic regression. So they does control that very well. And, and also the power is very, very good. So MDS is competitive. Uh, GM is another procedure we developed. It's, it's more complicated than the data splitting, so I won't explain here. And the finality by normal, there's no known adjustment. So in this case, we'll also see a similar phenomenon of inflation if you just use the BHQ. Uh, which since there's no adjustment, so we can only compare among ourselves, uh, which is the, uh, the multiple data splitting. You can see the control is still doing well, and the uh, Markov somehow is too conservative for unclear reasons. Uh, so this is also showing the Markov to power seems to be much lower than the other, other methods in this case. Is. Okay, so, so in a high dimension, uh, what we can do is, to, as I mentioned, so do uh, adjustment, uh, do this kind of uh, debiasing adjustment. And this is applicable to both linear model and uh, uh, the nonlinear model. Uh, 
So I will give you details as the work is purely uh, uh, directly uh, imported from real work. This is uh, Sun Hui Zhang and uh, Stephanie Zhang's paper, and also this is the one of our paper. These two are becoming uh, quite a, um, a landmark papers for debiasing uh, estimation. Uh, so after debiasing, so I won't give you much details. So basically, we need to uh, distribute the, uh, uh, this procedure where estimate the precision matrices uh, where some kind of normalized lasso, and then do the debiasing uh, procedure and the uh, rescaling. Uh, so that's, that's the whole procedure. The details are in the paper, I won't see much. So one the thing to notice is that for this statistic, the symmetry holds very well. Uh, but it's not really uh, uh, a normal distribution at, at all. So it's, uh, that's, that's one problem. So if you use this type of uh, uh, test statistic based on BH procedures, uh, they tend to be biased. The PI will actually have this kind of distribution. Uh, so they tend to be uh, wrong. Uh, but comparatively, if you use this uh, mirror statistics, it's pretty symmetry. And uh, this one controls well. Uh, so I will skip this. So, uh, so there are some numerical comparisons. And essentially, we're just showing the, uh, uh, the value work well. In this case, the knockoff is also working very well. So, in, most, in almost all our simulations, uh, the uh, multiple data splitting is very stable. It's very uh, uh, Variance is also very small, but even compare cases uh, for the number of false positives and so on. Because one of the things we, uh, people worry is that uh, not all have so called exact control. So we want to understand what does, what does that mean, how that differ from our non exact control. Uh, we, can't, we still can't answer that question. <laughs> so, uh, of course, one is theoretically guaranteed, we do not have theoretical guarantee, but practically, uh, this kind of uh, independent sign doesn't really make the uh, the FDR so FDP less variable to the actual proportion. So, um, so we probably I don't know how much time do I have. I mean, so I probably don't have much time. Uh, I will not to. Uh, this is another demonstration. I will not. I just briefly mentioned that this method we recently extended for the index models. Uh, I don't have time to discuss our, our work. So this is this is based on our, our early work on some theory on the uh, so-called high-dimensional index models. Uh, for years, this index models has been quite uh, interesting uh, variations of linear regressions. Uh, you assume uh, the relationship between x and y. Uh, is through a nonlinear link of some lower dimensional projections of X. So that's the original uh, index models. And people who should think about D is no greater than three, because uh, when D is greater than three, the signal for that is very, very weak. Uh, no, no one can, can safely estimate anything greater than three. So, but you know, why is uh, generalization of linear model? That's uh, so because of this nonlinear link and two is uh, higher. So, having, so, so the, one of the questions to estimate this uh, uh, lower dimension projections, we can also insert the uh, uh, high dimensional setup and to variable selections as well. We can imagine that this beta one and beta two are sparse in when well, X is high dimension, say 2000 dimensions. Uh, in which case we have both dimension reduction and also variable selections for this framework. Uh, by being able to do the selection and also dimension reduction consistently, as has been an open problem for, for some time. Uh, so that my postdoc, uh, Chen Ming, actually solved this, uh, this problem in the past few years. And, uh, and also proposed some procedures uh, to, to have this uh, uh, minimax optimal properties. Uh, so I will skip most of this and just just uh, uh, going to one. Uh, the, the final procedure for controlling the uh, index models. 
So we have one procedure. Let's see, where is that? We call the lasso sir, uh, which is to uh, sure I stopped. Why? Share screen. Okay, so uh, the third problem is essentially we can make up a fake response variable and we turn this uh, SDR as this, uh, this is, uh, index model with this subspace estimation problem into a lasso regression problem. So that's the uh, that's our, that's the content of this paper. So once you have this uh, lasso set up, uh, we can easily apply a device lasso and our uh, data splitting procedure. So that's our the general idea. And you will see it become less clear in this case because uh, because of the construction of these fake variables and then all the dependence among the constructions. And, uh, but anyway, so I, I think I'll just show you a little uh, simulations. Uh, in this particular simulation, uh, we have two dimensions, two sub-dimensions, um, this relationship, and also variable, the active variables are 40, uh, P is 1,000. Uh, in this case, we can do uh, compared to the, uh, uh, if, we, if we use the 90 highest ones, it still works somewhat. Uh, but not ideal because FDP is a little bit out of control. But if we do the deep bias and it uh, works uh, um, better, it does control variables in uh, the first discoveries quite well in this rather complicated nonlinear settings. Uh, the power is slightly lower because of, uh, of these controls. So this is still ongoing uh, about the theory and the methodology for this work, but I think it's uh, the results are quite promising as in this case. Um, so for low dimensions, uh, this there's no, uh, not too much problem in this case. Anyway, so this is some applications. I will skip that. Uh, so before I forget, so we've got several inspirations from different people. Uh, this work on this uh, so-called PCS is essentially talking about perturbation and uh, stability of the data. I think there are a lot of uh, inspirations on, on doing this kind of the data splitting procedure. And Lucas Johnson really brought us into this field. Uh, so, so these collaborators and people who have done this work uh, are uh, when I perform a postdocs and PhD students, without them, there's uh, nothing can be done here. Thank you very much for your interest. Yes. Thank you for exactly. I just wanted to make sure I understand correctly. So when you do a single data splitting, so you construct the nearest statistic and then you select the features based on that nearest statistic. And when you do multiple data split, for each of those, you have its own near statistic selection features. And then you look at the inclusion rates. So I'm curious, why don't you do the averaging of the near statistics across the splits? It's a very good point. Uh, I don't really have a logical answer to your question. Uh, I guess what the sub we had is this inclusion rate somehow can be intuitively linked to the Q values, FDRs uh, directly, literally almost. So I guess that's probably the main reason. So we, we say that everyone is one, so false statistic rate is Q, then we, we say that those false features, the inclusion rates are, should add up no more than Q. So that's sort of our reason for, essentially for choosing that. Uh, yeah, your suggestion makes makes sense. So averaging uh, Amstad, that, that could be uh, an uh, interesting approach to try. The The question then is how we set the criteria. Maybe, yeah, maybe use the false. Yeah, that's, that's a great idea. We can, yeah, we could, we could try that. That's probably, uh, um, easier interpretation as well. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for the talk, and this is also a clarification question. 
So we showed that slide where the DBAS generalized uh, linear model. So the asymptotic distributions are not exactly Gaussian, but right. we showed that the mirror statistics they had more Gaussian like distribution. So were those uh, mirror statistics incorporating the DBAS generalized uh, linear model method, or do you think that it was totally like different? Well, it's not more Gaussian. I think they're not more Gaussian than the BIH. I'm just saying they're symmetric. Both are symmetric. So, so in other words, we only need a symmetry to construct our, our FDR control regions. We don't need a normality or... Yeah. But the statistics, we are using the DDoS lasso. Yeah, right. Right. yeah, yes. And I was wondering if you could comment on the applications, for example, for what kind of biological data do we have to be? Yeah, so uh, this could be used for select uh, some of the features. And uh, so this is to illustrate that. Uh, so in this case, we are trying to uh, select uh, those sort of genes that are responsive to certain treatments and so on. And, and we're using this. Uh, logistic regression and trying to uh, to select these variables. And uh, yeah, I think for, for genetics, people may care more about the interpretations. Um, and in these selections, we do have some kind of uh, literature uh, support for like theory. We, we, we look up all the references to see whether these genes indeed involve that uh, act, act. That particular biological pathways and so on. So there are some supports, a few which do not have support, which we thought may be interesting to, to test out if someone wants to follow up. Uh, but if, as I mentioned earlier, really, if you're only interested in prediction, you actually may not want to do selection. So that's a, that's a different, yeah, or maybe you want to do some very, very sort of moderate uh, selections. That, more 